Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Pastor Clark Covington here with another episode of KJV Cafe. It is so good to be back here with you today. Amen. I don't have my coffee yet. I will get to it. I've just got a little green tea here in my Smoky Mountain National Park mug. Amen. It is just a full country morning here. Uh, Excited to preach God's word. I've been spending time in God's word. I've been praying over God's word, and I'm excited to share it with you here today. And I hope you're doing well. If you are new to the program, uh, thank you for joining us. Amen. Uh, It's good to have you here. We are a simple Bible study going verse by verse through uh, Genesis all the way to Revelation. Amen. And yes, sometimes we take a lot of time with verses and sometimes we don't. Uh, (laughs) That's just, uh, yeah. So it's, I guess it all evens out in the end, but um Here we're just looking at Genesis 18. What I put here part one for verse three, but really we're we're looking at the first three verses. Genesis 18, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. And so Abraham here sees three people, and this is mentioned as the Lord appearing to him. And if you go further in uh, Genesis 18, you go to Genesis 19, you see that two of them end up going on to visit Sodom. And so uh, then you can get into, are they angels, and is God with Abraham, and so forth. But for now, we're looking at all three in light of the Trinity, right? In light of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We've spent some time talking about God the Father and the role of the Father. And we've spent some time looking at Jesus as well through that role. A little bit of time on the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. And that's what we're looking at here today. In verse 3, Abraham says, My Lord, if I found favor in thy sight, like if I'm worthy of you, if you like me, if you love me, Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Don't leave. You know, stay right here. I'm going to fix you something good to eat. I'm going to give you something cool to drink. I'm going to help you revive here, okay? Now, this supernatural encounter, uh, the way that it's written, we don't know exactly if um, this individual or these three individuals, if you will, were familiar to Abraham, if he had seen them before, if they are... um, what he, what he would have spoken to earlier, right? If they're, if they're, if that's who they are, right? Um, is it a theophany, which is a visible manifestation to humankind of God? Um, you know, all the above, right? We don't know, but he wasn't like, who are you? Can you describe who you are? Can I see your picture ID? You know, obviously not, but he wasn't like that. He was just simply saying, hey, I see you. Please don't leave, right? And so we have this interaction. We're looking at it from the point of view of the Holy Trinity, and we'll dive deeper into the dichotomy of when the two go to Sodom versus the one that stays back and so forth. We can look at that later on, but for now, We're just looking at the Trinity, and the Trinity is very important to God. Amen. The number three is throughout the Bible, and God is referred to as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so there's three here, and we're looking at the role of the uh, Son. Amen. And, and, And kind of specifically God's plan, God the Father's plan for Jesus. And this is absolutely New Testament stuff, because if you read like, when Paul is mentioning God, he often mentions God the Father and God the Son. He'll mention these things together. Uh, and so we see here God the Father's role for the Son, and we'll tackle that as soon as we come back from this break, so stay tuned. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. 
So why did God send Jesus to die on the cross at Calvary? John 6, 38 through 40. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And so this is Jesus helping to delineate or specifically mention that while he he is God in the flesh, he is the Savior, he actually came from another, that's God the Father, who what? Who sent him. And he, he's not doing his own will. This indicates that he has an independent will, right? But he's doing the will of the Father. Verse 39, and this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Now, who has the Father given him? Well, that would be all those that would believe. Verse 40, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so we see here the will of the Father that sent the Son is that everyone that seeth the Son, capital S-O-N, believeth on him and have everlasting life. So the will of the Father is for mankind to be saved, amen? And so Jesus gets a lot of credit, and he should. He gave himself for us. What more could he have done? Yet let us not forget the will of the Father, the love of the Father, that Jesus was saying that what I'm doing here, this sacrificial gift I'm giving of myself, is not my will, but the Father's will, right? And so we see the Father's plan is to bring salvation to everyone. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Wow, so that's why he was sent. And it is for all, right? All men have the same ability to be saved, to achieve salvation, who hath appeared unto all men, right? 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You see, so we see again, Paul writing to his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy. There, there is one God, amen, and there is one mediator between God and men, and the man Christ Jesus is that mediator. And his will is for all to be saved. So the reason why this is important is not everybody believes this. Like if you say, well, why? Of course, yeah, Jesus came to save. Well, not everyone believes they need to be saved. Not everyone believes that God is in three parts. Again, I about fell out of my chair. I was watching a video for work of someone overseas that was very involved in their church and just flat out denied the deity of Christ. But he was very involved in their church. And I think the church would refer to themselves as evangelical. I mean, again, this this, this is as, as pertinent today as it's ever been and as disputed today probably as it's ever been. People, you know, want to have their own gods. They want to have their own truth. And that's a whole broader message. But the idea is that this is controversial. There is one God in three parts. And in those three parts, they each have unique roles. And the role of the father is the one that wants you to be saved, the heart for you, so willing, so loving to you that he'd give his only begotten Jesus. And the role is the son to be the mediator, amen, between God and man, to be the one that reconciles us to God by his free gift of salvation, the one that gives us the example of how to live and how to love and how to have uh, fidelity with God and, and oneness with God through living as he called us to live, right? Anybody can be saved. You know, the world is re- ready to dispose or cancel of somebody if they say one bad thing. If they do one bad thing, that's it. They're done, right? Well, thank God we're not beholden to the world. Amen. We're beholden to a loving, forgiving God that knows our form and is happy and delights in saving us. God delights in putting back together broken things. Amen. 
throughout the scripture, we see this example, right, of people that are broken, that are sinful, that God can use. People, whether they were broken and sinful and then get saved, like Saul, who had become Paul, the apostles to the Gentiles. People that have been godly from a young age and fall into sin, like King David, when he fell into adultery and so forth. God restored King David. God restored and made new Saul, who become Paul. And so much more so, we see throughout the scriptures, God's forgiveness. I mean, every times I'm reading, especially like in the Old Testament, I'm reading about some wicked king, and I'm just like, God, I cannot believe you haven't wiped him out yet. And God gives him chance after chance after chance. And really, until they become so boastful and proud, then maybe God has to take action. But generally speaking, he is just so patient and long-suffering. He is always so patient and long-suffering. Today, there are many people that have blasphemed God, that have rejected God, that have been an enemy of God, and yet he's allowed them to live. He's allowed them to breathe his air, to eat his food, to reside on his earth, to walk puffed up in front of him. He's allowed all of this for a due season because he's so long-suffering. And so no one is too good. They don't need to be saved. And no one is too bad that they can't be saved. Amen. I mean, think about this. You could have somebody, just think about it from the world's perspective, right? You could have somebody that is the most renowned academic in the world, has more awards than anybody, is absolutely brilliant, is rich upon rich, and the world can't stop celebrating that person. They give them their own street, their own building name. They give them a plaque and honor and a parade and a holiday, and they're given awards, and they get to fly over the world and participate in all these events, and everybody just seems to fawn after them. And if they've rejected Christ, they'll be in the devil's hell no matter how much the world celebrated them. And you could have a despicable murderer, uh, wicked beyond measure, sitting in prison that earnestly goes to the Lord in prayer and asks the Lord to forgive their sins. They earnestly accept Christ as Savior. They truly believe on Christ, understanding their sin nature, understanding their need for Jesus Christ as Savior, for their propitiation, for their atonement, amen, for, for the substitutionary death that Christ provided. They accept Christ as Savior. They believe he was risen from the grave, amen. They are saved and born again, and they'll be in heaven. They'll be in heaven. You see how messed up this world is? I promise you, if you have worldly fame or success or money or whatever, it can be intoxicating, and it can even lead you to think that you've done something acceptable or good. But when you look at God's standard and you look at God's holiness and you look at God's singular way to him and to peace with him and to his heaven and to eternity with him, you realize it must come through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other way. That is God's plan. And that is the role of the son. Amen. And we have more here that deals with why, like what? You know, some people may wonder, well, why do we need to be saved? You know, why can't, you know, God just, you know, in mass forgive us all and let us just live our life? You know, like why, why do we need to be saved? You know, you, you may be saying, I haven't done anything horrible. I didn't kill anybody. I haven't boasted myself up. I'm just, I follow the rules of the government. I live a good, simple life. And there's nothing wrong with living a good, simple life. But because of that does not, um, get rid of the sin debt that you inherited all the way from Adam and Eve. And that that sin debt, that hereditary sin debt is passed down from generation to generation. We're not thought to be sinners. We're not converted to be sinners. We, we don't just one day decide to sin. We are born with sin. It is within us from birth. And the only way to, to, to pay that sin debt is through Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross. There's simply no other way to be saved. Amen. There's no other way to please God. There's no other way to have peace with God. And the role of the son is to fulfill God's great love for us, to give us a path to reconciliation with, with him and to help us to understand our new life in Christ and how we are to be new creatures and to help others in the ministry of reconciliation to be reconciled to him, to be evangelists, to, to be disciples and all the rest. Tune in next time. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. You can email Brother Clark directly at clark 
at EnduringPromise.org. See you again tomorrow, same time, same place.